Thanks, and welcome everyone to the Condensed Matter and Statistical Physics part of the program. Uh, our first pedagogical lecture is Sasha Abanov from Stony Brook University and the Simon Center for Geometry and Physics. Uh, we've set it up so that the pedagogical lectures are 90 minutes and then the research lectures are one hour. Um, so he's going to tell us about hydrodynamics, variational principles, and integrability. Okay. Oh, okay, it works. Okay, hello everybody. First of all, thank, thanks a lot to organizers and Menas in particular for inviting me to come to this workshop. I'm first time here and it's amazing facilities, so I enjoy it quite a lot. Uh, I was asked to give a pedagogical talk on, um, on something between hydronomics and integrability. And I hope that I did not make it too pedagogical. It will not bore you completely. So, but I will start from the very beginning. So the content will be as follows. So first I will do some introduction into hydrodynamics in general. Then I will talk about a few topics in one-dimensional hydrodynamics. And then we will talk about variational principles. And if we have time, we'll talk about some few other topics and applications of hydrodynamics, but this will be the main uh, content of, of my lectures. And uh, integrability will be in this part, but not too much. But there will be an other pedagogical lectures by, for example, Joel Moore, who will probably touch on integrability in applications with collective behavior a little bit more. And, and Fabian Nessler will probably continue next week as well. So let me start with introduction into hydrodynamics. And to start with, let us consider the typic typical scales for molecular collisions. Okay, let me ask, is this too small? People from over there? Good? Okay. Okay, so I'll try not to get even smaller. So uh, let us consider air as an example. One liter of air has about 10 to the 22 molecules. And these molecules collide with typical time of the order of 10 to minus 10 seconds. And uh, the typical mean free pass length is something like 60 nanometers, which means 6 times 10 to the minus 8 meters. So let us consider the volume of the air, which has some non-zero velocity molecules move, and let's naively estimate what's going on when two molecules collide. If two molecules collide, then basically they lose memory about their initial velocities after a couple of collisions. And naively, you should expect that if you have the motion of the air, then this motion will be relaxed in about this scale, which is which is very short scale, and this is definitely against our everyday experience. We have winds and, and all that, so it's on, on the order of seconds or even sometimes days and, and months. But if you just base your, you base your estimate on the intermolecular collisions, that it will be really microscopic scales. So what, what's going on? So what, what's, how do we see collective behavior on a human scale uh, while the collision time is so short? And the answer is, is deep but relatively simple. When two molecules collide, although each molecule individually forgets its initial velocity, but the total momentum of, of two molecules is conserved during collisions. And therefore, if you have a volume of the air, then uh, the momentum of this, of this piece of the air cannot relax due to the collisions of molecules inside the, the volume. So what you have is that 
as soon as you have some macroscopic volume, then the only way momentum can relax is due to the collisions in the, in the neighborhood of the boundary of this volume and the typical width of this, of this uh, boundary uh, neighborhood is about mean free pass. And while the number of molecules in the volume is proportional to L cube, but the number of molecules in, inside this layer is proportional to L squared times L mean free pass. And therefore, you have the factor increase of the order of L divided by L mean free pass, which gives you something like 10 to the 8, and which brings this 10 to the minus 10 scales to, to reasonable scale of the order of seconds. So therefore, we basically can say that the total hydrodynamics and total idea is that there are some microscopic flows of air which do not relax completely to equilibrium in microscopic scale is due to some conservation laws, local conservation laws inside the system. And this is the main message of, of this exercise, is that uh, the hydrodynamics is an emergent phenomenon due to the local conservation laws. So now let me talk a little bit about local conservation laws. So one of those conservation laws is, is the momentum conservation. So P1 plus P1 plus P2 equals P1 prime plus P2 prime. We also have the conservation of number of particles. So during collisions, the number of particles, uh, the total, the number of particles n equals the number of particles after the collision. And also, considering these collisions elastic, we have conservation of energy. So basically, uh, all these conservation laws uh, slow down relaxation of, 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 the, of the macroscopic motion of, of, of fluids uh, and because of the same reason. So basically to violate those, uh, to, to, to relax uh, conserved quantities, you have to relax them through the boundary, which occupies smaller volume. Yes? Yeah, so this is, um, this is the number Okay. So the number of, 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 of molecules available for collisions which can, in principle, relax momentum and locate it into this, in this, in this boundary region, L, M, MFP is the average length between collisions. Yeah. Because, because the molecule from inside can collide with molecule from outside inside this boundary, and these molecules will go back with totally different momentum, and this will go back here. So effectively, the molecules inside this volume relax their momentum. It's, it's because of due to the collisions of molecules inside with molecules outside. Neither collisions inside nor collisions outside can actually relax momentum of this volume, but collisions between inside molecules and outside can. And, 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 and this is the volume where it happens. So the relative volume, uh, which is the total, the, the relative number of molecules everywhere here, the relative number of collisions which happen everywhere here, to the number of collisions which actually relax the momentum here, is, is this divided by this, which is, which is, which is. This, this number is huge, it's of the order 10 to the 8. Um, like if, if, if you take L to be something like one meter, and this is like six times 10 to the minus eight meters, that's it's 10 to the seventh. So, so this number is huge, and although this scale is very small, but being multiplied by this huge number, it gives you some reasonable time of relaxation. Yeah, thank you. By the way, MFP is mean free pass. Yeah, please interrupt with questions. That's, that's really great. That, that, that interrupt. So uh, we have few conservation laws. Generically, if, if the number of particles is conserved, we have some three. That's typical for, high, for textbook hydrodynamics. But we can have some exceptions. For example, if we can see the phonons, then phonons sometimes can behave hydrodynamically. 
but the number of phonons is not conserved. Or, uh, or for example, you can have chemical reactions, then the number of particles will not be conserved individu individually as well, and so on and so forth. So depending on the system, you can have different number of conservation laws. Or you can have additional conservation laws. For example, you have several species of particles, and each species, number of uh, species is conserved. So that's the simplest example. So, so basically, all those local conservation laws, uh, this local conservation laws should be written as conservation laws, and these are hydrodynamic equations. So basically, this written in a macroscopic form gives you hydro equations. So let me show how it's done at the example of the simplest hydrodynamic equations or, and the most common, which is the continuity equation. And the continuity equation is, is written for the mass density of particles. So rho is the delta m divided by delta v, the mass density of particles. And let me write the equation in the following form, as a partial differential equation. The time derivative of rho plus divergence of some j equals zero, where j is mass current density, some vector. So if you have this law, then the other way to write it is to write it in the following form. Let's take a total mass inside the three-dimensional volume V, which is given by integral of, of density with respect to volume element. And let's differentiate this mass with respect to time. Then this is equal to T rho over dt dv. Here I assume that volume is fixed. So I have a volume V which is fixed and I just count the number of particles inside. It's not changing in time, the volume. And then using this equation I substitute minus divergence of j dv and using Gauss theorem I will convert the integral of a volume of a divergence of a vector field into the integral over the surface the boundary of the volume of j and the element of the area. And what you can see from here is that the mass inside the volume can change only through the boundary of the volume due to the flux of the particles of the mass through the boundary. So basically, this equation keeps the information about the fact that, 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 that the number of particles or mass of the particles can relax only by transferring those particles across the boundary. It is not possible to take this volume and, for example, take particle from here and insert it here instantaneously. The particle should come and, and cross the boundary and, and create the mass uh, density, mass current density. Any questions so far? Okay. So this equation is the general form of the uh, local conservation laws. The local here is important because if you just say that mass is conserved, this is not it. This is that it's locally conserved, that you cannot really change the mass inside it unless you cross the boundary. You cannot instantaneously disappear and appear from somewhere outside. Okay? And this is a general form. Uh, basically, for any conserved quantity, we can, we can, we can write equation in, in a similar form. So let me now talk about the other conserved quantities. So we will talk about mass. We already talked about this, momentum. energy and angular momentum considerations. So we introduce the following densities. Rho is the mass density.
E i is the momentum density. So this momentum density is uh, defined similarly to this. So you will take some vol some small volume delta v, delta v, compute the momentum inside its volume. Momentum has components. So when I write this, I mean that i goes from one to three in three-dimensional space, and you you take this this momentum divided by this volume, and this is momentum density, which I call small pi. Okay. And similarly, epsilon will be the energy density. Actually, let me call it this E to be consistent with following notations. Okay. And then I write three conservation laws, which is the first one I just rewrite from what I did, plus divergence of j equals zero. But I also write that dt of pi equal plus divergence of some quantity, which I will call capital I, uh, which is separate for every component of momentum. So this is the x component of momentum has a conservation with the current given by pxj equals zero. And finally, for energy DTE plus divergence of energy current equals zero. These equations one, two, three introduce quantities like mass, uh, mass current density. This is the called momentum flux. Let me write it. Pi is momentum flux tensor. And JE is energy current. And you have to add the word density to all of it. It's all densities. So the true energy current is obtained by taking, for example, energy current density and integrating it over volume. So these are three equations which, which guarantee that mass, momentum, and energy are locally conserved. Yes? Oh, I didn't say yet, this yet. So, and the next I wanted to give you some exercise, which is answers some partially your question, that question. So the exercise is the following. Consider m i j equals x i i i so x i just a second x i pi p j p j minus x j p i this is angular momentum tensor this is the analog of x cross p in three dimensions, but the way to represent it as a tensor works in any dimension, so this is a bit more convenient way. And exercise is the following. Find the necessary conditions for conservation of Mij. So find condition for conservation Mij. So basically, you have to differentiate it with respect to time, use those equations, and see under which conditions this read can be written as a total divergence of something. And let me tell you the answer. The answer is that necessary condition is that Pij is symmetric. This is the... the uh, this is these are densities, right? Let's be the density of momentum. It's momentum current. Okay? So so basically if you just have these equations plus the conditions that this pi tensor is symmetric, then you have conservation of angular momentum as well. So the reason why the conservation of angular momentum uh, is is not 
uh, written as a separate equation, but as a sum condition on already existing quantities is, is pretty interesting. If you can see that the general diffeomorphisms of the space, then general diffeomorphism is all, is, represents a local translational invariance, which is, which is generated by this momentum density. But if you have general diffeomorphisms, then the rotation is one, local rotation is one of those and can be written in terms of the generators of local translations. And therefore, this momentum, uh, uh, angular momentum conservation is sort of a consequence of, of a momentum conservation. You, have, you need only one additional condition on, on the type of the tensor. But I'm not going to go deep into that. Uh, let us now look at those equations. And we see that we have just uh, five equations here in three-dimensional space. This is one, two, and then there are three equations for every component of momentum. So there are five equations and many more variables, right? So you have density, you have three components of momentum, you have energy, there are already five, but then you also have these guys which have a lot, several components and so on and so forth. So this is not closed system of equations. So what you need for this to be closed system is you need some expressions for those uh, fluxes and currents in terms of the quantities themselves. Okay. So now we are going to talk about constitutive relations. So how to make this system closed? Why, in general, should those fluxes be expressed in terms of the quantities themselves? And the logic here is the following. There are, so let, let me go step by step. First of all, we assume that all quantities, except for ones protected by conservation laws, relax very quickly to their local equilibrium values. Okay. So assume quick relaxation for everything. Except for quantities protected by conservation laws, so ex except for rho, E, and Pi. That's the first step. Yes. Uh, it's equivalent to the absence of external angular uh, 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 torque acting on the system. So in a sense, yes, if you assume that, that, that your property of your space is, is uh, isotropic, so there is no external torque in particular, then it, will, it should be symmetric. Yes. So when, if you do this exercise, you will basically see it, because you will see that the rate of the change of angular momentum is equal to something which is anti-symmetric part of PIJ, which should be interpreted as a torque. That's true, yeah, that's true. I assumed only the conservation laws which I included here, not nothing additional, yeah. No internal quantum numbers. That's true. Uh, I already mentioned that these are basic conservation laws, but you have, can have, in principle, many more. So, so in, in, in that case, you should consider this and, and add the equations and add different constitutive relations. Yes? This one? This one? Yeah. Okay, this one. I, I, here, I'm, I'm considering the example of the, of the air and collision of pair of molecules inside the volume. So I'm just saying that, that if inside the volume two molecules collide, then I assume that during these collisions, momentum doesn't change, the number of particles doesn't change, and the energy of these two molecules does not change. That's right, yes. 
because of that, my logic is the following, because of that it's conserved for internal one, then the only way the energy inside this volume, the total energy, can change if some of the particles or with some of the energy crosses the surface. And this is represented with this type of, 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 of laws. That's true, but this is written, this is only valid inside the volume. Yeah. So, and, and this is trying to take this into account and saying that if there is no inside, for example, if this is, for example, closed surface, then this will be identically zero. But if there is a surface, then in principle another option exists, which is the flux of this conserved quantities through the boundary. Okay? So let me move on. So let's first assume that quick relaxation for everything except for density, energy, and momentum. For example, if you have two particles colliding, uh, then, for example, you can ask, so the momentum is conserved, the sum of the energies, which is the squares of momentum, is conserved. How about P1 to the 4 plus P2 to the 4? Is it conserved? No, it is not. And therefore, if you really look at the pair collision of two particles, this quantity will relax. And nothing prevents it from relaxing on the scale of 10 to the minus 10 seconds. Therefore, I assume that all quantities, all other quantities except for those which are protected by local conservation laws, are relaxing very quickly to the equilibrium. And then, locally, our fluid should be fully characterized by the local values of rho, p, i, and p. So if everything else relaxes very quickly to equilibrium values, then the only thing which is left, which is evolving slowly in space and time, are those conserved quantities. And therefore, fluid is, is fully characterized by these local values. And that means that I can express J I, I, J, and J, E, in terms of, of rho, P, I, and E. And that makes my system of equations 1 to 3 closed. Okay? So, relations... such as rho, uh, such as j equals j of rho p i e, etc. of all quantities are called constitutive relations. The next step is that if we now also assume that all those quantities are relaxed very slowly on the scale of collision time and mean free pass. Then we also can use gradient expansion. Expansion in gradients. For, for these lectures, I will not concern myself with expansion in time derivatives. So I will always assume only first order in time derivatives. But expansion in special gradients means that basically every gradient that I have can, uh, comes with the multiplication by mean free pass, so that this is dimensionless quantity. So every additional gradient gives me a small number if, if the gradients of all quantities are, are small on the, on the scale of L. So therefore, the logic is that in the first approximation, zero approximation, I write something without gradients altogether, then with one gradient, with two gradients, and so on and so forth. And I mean gradients in this relation. So this J should be totally expressed in terms of local quantities rho, p, i, e, 
and also their gradients. So, but for as a zero approximation, I will not add gradients, then one gradient, two gradients. And in principle, I can build some regular scheme of, of how to write uh, gradient expansion up to some order and then improve it and so on and so forth. So to make, to make it clear, let me, let me give you a simple example, which is example. And the example is called diffusion equation. And what I'm going to consider as an example is the example of hydrodynamics with just one conserved quantities. So suppose I have only one conserved quantity, which is rho. So I have only one equation, dt rho plus divergence of j equals zero. And let me assume that my system is isotropic and translationally invariant. So I really do not have anything else except for rho, j, and gradients for my constructions. And I want to assume that everything else relaxes quickly to the equilibrium value. So the system is fully characterized by density rho. And what I want to do is I want to write the constitutive relation expressing j as, as some combination of rho and, and various derivatives of rho gradient of rho, Laplacian of rho, et cetera. All possible derivatives of density, okay? So the question is, what's the simplest one I can come up with? Any ideas from students? So what is the simplest relation? How can I express the current in terms of, in terms of density? I cannot write something like this, right? And I cannot even write something like, like the arbitrary function of rho, because this is scalar. So I, I need vector. So I have to make vector somehow, and I do not have any special directions, because I have fully isotropic system. So the only way to make vector is to use ingredients, and the only thing you can write is something like this. Gradient of rho. And let me write minus here. And so this is the arbitrary function of rho, local function of rho. And this is gradient of rho. This is vector. If I want to write something else, I really need to increase the number of gradients. And each new gradient comes with, with small quantity mean free pass. So those will be next corrections, next order corrections in mean free pass. OK? Any questions? Okay, so if I substitute this constitutive relation into, into my expression, then I will obtain dt rho equals, equals gradient of d of rho gradient of rho. Okay. Does this make sense? So this is closed equation, assuming that I know d of rho. So, so, so this is as, as far as I can go without considering the particular microscopics. Some additional simplification can be considered if you assume that rho deviates just a little bit from the background. Suppose that rho equals rho zero plus, plus delta rho. So, the, so you have uniform density and small deviation of, from uniform density. Then what you can do is you can, because this gradient already depends on the only small piece, then this can be expanded and replaced by just d of rho zero, which let me call it just d. And then this d is spatially uniform, so I can go it outside, and then I obtain equation d t rho equals d times Laplacian of rho. And this is very familiar diffusion equation. Okay. 
any questions? So basically, conclusion is the following, that if you have a system with just one conserved quantity, then most universally, it's this conserved quantity relaxes diffusively in, in its smallest order ingredients. Uh, and, and, and then if you need corrections, you can always include them. Okay. So diffusion equation is one example of the simplest example of hydrodynamics. Well, yes. Oh, yes, absolutely. So, so there are a lot of questions like viscoelasticity. That's generally this oreology. There are many things where time derivatives are important. One example you can do it at home. I usually like to show this demo, but but it's messy. So, if you if you buy starch in a shop, just regular starch and mix it 50% starch, 50% water, and just thoroughly mix it. The, the fluid which, is, uh, you, which you obtain is called non-Newtonian fluid, and it's amazing uh, in properties. I definitely recommend everyone to do that. It's, so what happens is the following, that at very slow scale, it behaves as a fluid. So if you, for example, grab it and slowly take it, it will go between your fingers. But if you try to, I don't know, put the hand and try to jerk it out of the fluid, it will not allow you. It will solidify immediately. So at, at, at quick times, it behaves as solid. So the, the standard thing, which we actually did with, with school children, is that we fill the pool with this fluid, and then we jump on it. So you jump, and it, it, it holds your, your weight, but as soon as you slow down, you, you sink. It's, it's amazing. So you can find on YouTube the demos, but it's better to do some small quantity yourself and, and try it. So yes, there are, there are such things. And, and this is generally called viscous elasticity type of problems when you really have to consider uh, additional corrections due to the time derivatives or even infinitely many time derivatives when you basically, in all time-dependent quantities, there is non-trivial dependence on omega, on the frequency. Yeah, that exists. Okay, so we are done with our simplest example. So let us consider the most relevant example for typical textbook hydrodynamics. Namely, we will consider the example of Galilean invariant. Zero order with uh, three conserved quantities, mass, energy, and momentum. So I'm not going to do it step by step, trying to ask you to guess the relationships, but I will just write them down, constitutive relations, and, and you can kind of see that this is more or less what you can write uniquely using symmetries of the problem. So, okay, so I have dIji equals zero. I'm rewriting this system once again. These are conserved quantities. And now what I have to do is I have to somehow write a relationship between J pi and, and, and J energy with those three quantities. Essentially express those in, in terms of this, but it's a little bit convenient to do it a little bit differently. So first of all, I will introduce new notation. So instead of Ji, I will write rho Vi, introducing Vi, which we will call velocity field. Okay. This is nothing so far. This is just replacing variable ji by vi. So I did not do any, anything uh, here. But what I will do is I will write that, so using this, uh, the fact that, that momentum and mass are, uh, I'm considering one component fluid only. So mass and momentum are carried by the same type of, well, mass and momentum always carried by. So I will basically write that pi is, is also given by identically the same formula. So I will essentially use in, in a hidden form Galilean invariance here. So this is, or I will introduce this. So basically, essentially, I'm writing that the momentum uh, density is the same as, as the flux of mass. Okay? And then I will write the simplest possible Pij. So I basically need, need uh, two indices, space indices. 
So I will have to write vi, vj if I don't want to use any uh, derivatives. And I, I would like to write it without using gradients. And the only vector quantity I have so far is vi. So I will write this vi, vj. And then if system is Galilean invariant, that coefficient here must be rho. Generally, it can be not related to rho. It can be function of rho and energy and something like that. But, but this will be it. And then I will write some another quantity p, which in principle depends on rho and energy. But instead of energy, I will use local value of the local density of entropy times delta i j. You can use delta i j always because you don't need special direction of the, for, for using delta i j. So this is a constitutive relation which expresses momentum flux through velocity and it turns out to be pressure. Okay. This is not enough, then, because I need also relation between energy and energy current. So energy I will write as rho v squared over 2 plus rho epsilon. And the energy current I will write as rho v i v squared over 2 plus W, and W is the local density of enthalpy, epsilon plus P divided by rho. So P without indices is pressure. Please don't confuse it with momentum. This is enthalpy, the unit mass. And epsilon is internal energy the unit mass. And finally, in addition to this, also, also there are thermodynamic relationships, which is dw equals tds plus 1 over rho dp and d epsilon which of course can be obtained from here i will just write it for completeness is tds plus p over rho squared d rho yes Say it again. Such as what? Yeah. In principle, what I should yeah. In principle, what I should do to make this system closed is I have to express j pi j in terms of this five. Okay. But I can do it in in, in different ways. So what I did here is I assume that my independent quantities. Are a rho and velocity and an entropy density. Plus. Yeah. That, that one. Right. So uh, let me not go into, into details. What I just want to illustrate um, is that is that this gives you the relationship between j, pi, and j, and these guys, in such a way that you are left only with five independent quantities, which is sufficient to solve this. And I assume that you know this unknown function, which is the, knowing this function means that you know equation of state, which already can be found uh, from velocity equals zero condition. If you find the equilibrium with velocity equals zero, you reduce everything to thermodynamics, you first write everything, this is the, the thermodynamics will be part of this, and these are purely thermodynamic relationships. This one, I mean, it's written in this form, but you can easily recognize that this is the standard that dE equals TDS minus PDV, if you express it in terms of densities. So, so from that, you will relate these quantities, and in principle, it is possible to write exactly assumptions and symmetries that I'm using. In particular, I used Galilean symmetries writing, writing expressions like that and like that. 
So in principle, you can write it and show that this is the consistent zero order, uh, zero order uh, relationships which you can write, not involving gradients. Okay. So in addition to this, you can also find corrections proportional to gradients of velocity, for example, which will give you some viscous effects. But this is the, what is called zero order hydrodynamics, and this is what every textbook on hydrodynamics starts with by just basically postulating this stuff. Okay. So this is called zero order hydra. And I have exercise. Let me go for exercise here before I go to the left part of the blackboard. Exercise is the following. Uh, starting from the equation, write equation on derive. Derive from what is written here, the following equation, dts plus vi dis equals zero. Where s enters here, and, 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 and also here. This is the uh, mass density of entropy. Okay. This is some exercise. This is some algebra. So what you essentially do is the following. You will take this expression, substitute it here instead of E. You take this expression, substitute it here instead of J. And then you use all these uh, conditions to get down to the time derivative of s. And this is what you will get. Okay. This, using continuity equation, this also can be written as dt of rho s plus di of rho s vi equals zero. So you can easily see that if this dt acts on rho, and this di acts on rho vi, then, then you get identity because of this. And, and uh, if it acts on s, what you're left with will be this. So this and this are equivalent if you have continuity equation for density. The meaning of this is a little bit different. It's quite nice. The meaning of this is that the entropy, so if, if you are in a fluid, and you have a fluid particle, some small piece of fluid, you calculate the entropy of this small piece of fluid, and then you follow this piece of fluid somewhere, then uh, during your transport of this piece of fluid, the entropy inside this piece is, is, is preserved. Because this is what is written, is essentially the convectional derivative. So this is a derivative in the reference frame moving with velocity v. Okay. So there is a good notation, which is, which is dt equals derivatives with respect to time plus v times gradient. And in this notation, this is written simply as dt s equals zero. So the entropy per unit particle or per unit mass is transported by the flow. It does not change. And that means, in particular, that in zero order hydrodynamics there is no dissipation. If you now will try to, to add gradient corrections to this, to write some terms in constitutive relations proportional to gradients, and repeat the same derivation, you will see that this quantity will be always positive, should be always positive, uh, consist consistently with second law of thermodynamics. And that will give you some restrictions on those gradient terms, additional restrictions. But in zero order hydrodynamics, this is zero. So it means that in zero order hydrodynamics, what we describe is adiabatic flow of, of uh, ideal fluid. So for every piece, it's the, it's the process which going is adiabatic. The entropy of this piece doesn't change. It's on the fluid. And this is essentially the same as we explained, but this shows you that the entropy per unit volume is conserved 
which means that this quantity should be interpreted as the entropy current. Then this is the entropy per unit volume, and then this expression is again has a form of continuity equation with entropy current and the density of the entropy. Okay. Any questions? Yes. Yes. How does it, how does it imply it? This one? This one? Yes, this one. It's, it just shows that it's the same as this one. It shows that the entropy of a piece of fluid does not change. So if you start it, for example, with entropy of this piece being zero, it will stay zero forever. If you start it with positive, it will stay positive. And you cannot start with negative. So, uh, in addition, if you start with entropy being constant everywhere, then it will stay constant. So the entropy can only be brought from the regions where it, it exists. If, if it's constant everywhere, then no matter how you move this piece of fluid, it will be still constant. So this is called adiabatic flow, and this is general property of zero order hydro. Adiabatic means that the entropy of a given piece of a fluid doesn't change in time. And if entropy is initially constant, it will stay constant. This is called isentropic flow, the same entropy flow. So a lot of things simplify very much for isentropic flow. So let me move to the other part of the blackboard, the green board, yes. Yes. Well, the ones which I circled, the rho, v, i, and s. Uh, the e is given by just this, and epsilon is considered to be known function of rho and s. And that's, that's you need to know. This is also you need to know this is equation of state. You have to take microscopics and derive this particular expression from, from microscopics, thermodynamic expression from microscopics. So, equation of, so essentially, this constitutive relations is like a generalization of the concept of equation of state from thermodynamics to hydrodynamics. Yes. Uh, this, that's all about local equilibrium. The, the fact that I can, in principle, write the relationship between fluxes and quantities themselves is because everything is characterized only by those five quantities, which means that everything else relaxes to local equilibrium. So I just do not have any quantities to use except for those. Yeah, this is definitely the consistency of this equation is a hypothesis of local equilibrium. So if for some particular reason in some system you have just those conserved quantities, but you have some other quantity which is closely conserved, so which is relaxes particularly slowly, then there will be some transient behavior. So you can, if, if there is only one such quantity, or, or few. So you can say that initially you really have to use five plus one quantities to write equations, and only in a long time asymptotics that other quantities dies out and then you come back to this hydro. Okay? So you have to be careful, but, but if we assume that generically everything else relaxes quickly except for those answered quantities. This is my assumption, number one. Then it must be expressible in terms of those answered quantities. Okay? So now let me move to that part and then just rewrite these equations and uh, do some particular few simplifications for some particular cases of hydrodynamics which are, uh, occur most common, commonly. So let me rewrite that system in the following way. dt rho equals minus rho di vi. Actually, let me write even it in as a divergence of velocity. Then 
Okay, I forgot to give you one more exercise. One more exercise is to substitute instead of p rho v into this equation, use continuity equation to remove time derivative of density, and derive equation for velocity. So exercise is derive equation for velocity. And I will write the answer over there. So this system of equations is identical to the system of equation on the right-hand side. And the basically, first equation tells you that, that when you transport fluid particles, so when a piece of a fluid moves, the density of, in this piece can only change if you have divergence of velocity, if you have motion of this type, compression or expansion. This is divergence of velocity. This tells you that velocity can change only due to the gradient of pressure. And this is known as Euler equation. And this tells you that entropy per unit particle, per unit mass, is, is, is not changing if you move with, the, with this particle, with this uh, fluid particle. By the way, some important comment. When I'm saying particle from now on, I do not mean molecules. I mean fluid particle, which is the, the concept of this type, that if you take a small piece of fluid such that it has macroscopically many particles, so like 10 to the 10, okay, it's still much less than 10 to the 22. So you still consider it as almost infinitesimal from physics point of view. So what I mean by fluid particle is some piece of a fluid which has a lot of particles, so we already can use all these local equilibrium conjectures here. But that quantities like density, momentum, and so on and so forth change still slowly on the scale of this particle, on the scale of this size. Landau and Lipschitz call this physically small volume or something like that. So when, I, when you write derivative here, you mean that you have to change for, look for the change of pressure, which is still much bigger on the scales, which is still much bigger than, than the size of the, between molecules, but, but on the size of fluid particle molars. Okay, so I have these three, three equations, and then there are some known simplifications. For example, suppose that S is constant. So you started with some initial state with constant entropy density. Then uh, this tells you that it will stay constant forever, and therefore in equation of state, P equals P of density and entropy, you can basically forget about this because it's constant. And you can see the pressure on the only as a function of density. And then uh, this expression sim simplify. You can forget about this equation. So you have dt rho equals minus rho divergence of velocity. And dt vi equals minus 1 over rho di p, which is a function of rho. And the last one, of course, can be written as minus derivative of some function w of rho. Because if you have just function of rho, you take derivative, then you get another function of rho, you integrate, so you get some other function of rho. This is called enthalpy, generally. But enthalpy is constant, it's constant density, which is the same as chemical potential. Okay? So this is a simplification, quite, quite significant simplification. Instead of uh, additional equation, I use simplified just four equations. Okay, and one more simplification, which is very common, is to assume that the fluid is incompressible. So let's assume that fluid is incompressible. Namely, that the divergence of velocity, well, incompressible generally means that 
dt rho equals zero. That when you flow with particles, the density of this piece does not change. But from the first equation, it also means the divergence of velocity equals zero. This is very often called incompressibility condition. If divergence of velocity is zero, then that is called incompressible flow, then in this flow, the density cannot change. Density is constant if you move with the particle. It doesn't mean that density is constant at a given point. In principle, you can still have the distribution of density, like density rho 1 here and rho 2 here, and when you have a flow, the, the density and zip point can change because it used to be rho 2, but then liquid with density rho 1 displaced and displaced rho 2, and, and the density at this point becomes rho 2. So it can change, but it can change only because it, it, the higher density or lower density can be brought to this point, not the density of a given fluid particle. And in this case, you just have equations which is divergence of velocity equals zero, and still earlier equation then dt v i equals minus di w of rho. You still have this. Okay. And if even more rho is constant initially, then rho is constant for all times, and then this simplifies even well, almost the same. The velocity equals zero, and dt vi equals minus di pressure divided by rho. I can, rho is constant, so I can introduce it as such as some pressure per unit mass quantity. The interesting case here is that pressure here is not independent quantity anymore. It's to totally determined by, by velocity flow. But we will talk about this hopefully at some point later if we have time. So there are these particular cases. The most studied case is probably the case of incompressible fluid with constant velocity. And there are many problems. For, even this problem is not solved in the sense that people do not know uh, uh, exactly under what conditions this equation has, has solutions. I think about earlier equation, it is known that it develops singularities for, for arbitrary initial conditions. It's not clear whether these singularities can be cured for all times including viscosity, and so on and so forth. There are many open questions even for this simplest case. So, any questions? Right. This, this dt, remember, this derivative is dt plus vi di rho. What I'm saying is that this being zero doesn't mean that this is zero. Meaning that if you look at this particular point, density at this particular point can, can change. What cannot change if you take fluid particle which moves and you calculate the density of fluid particle here and here, it will be the same. This is what this large D means. Is that answers? Okay. So one more topic of introduction that I have to cover before going to one-dimensional examples is the origin of hydrodynamic equation. So I'm I'm trying to to be precise here, saying not hydrodynamics, but hydro equations. Okay? And my part A will be that the origin is the slow dynamics of locally conserved quantities, which is what I was talking about for now, all, all time before that. And this is one of the origins of hydrodynamic equations. And so let me write it. Slow dynamics. of locally and um, and quick relaxation of all other quantities, I should add. And uh, for example, 
Let me give you another example, just to shed a little bit more light of how actually you can derive hydrodynamics from microscopics. What you do is the following. You are saying that if you have a local equilibrium, so we have example of a gas, and you have a local equilibrium of this gas in a given point, and you're saying that the distribution function of molecules, now I'm talking about molecules, depends on the velocities of molecules and, and the position. And, and just a second, what I'm assuming here is that I have a gas with very rare collisions, so I can actually describe my system pretty well by looking at the one particle distribution function. So I'm having here the R and U variables, phase space for one molecule, and the state of one molecule is somewhere here. And there is another molecule, another molecule. So basically my gas is defined by the density of those points in, in a phase space of one, uh, of one molecule. Okay. And I'm saying that there are collisions. During these collisions, these guys can actually jump in this phase space. But I'm assuming that it's local equilibrium. So this F is at local equilibrium value, and we know that local equilibrium given by constant density rho bar, some constant temperature t bar, the power of 3 half, e to the minus m u bar, u, u, sorry, u squared over 2 times temperature, temperature bar. So this is the local equilibrium of my gas. Uh, I can actually boost this gas with a constant velocity to slightly generalize this. Then I will obtain here u bar minus v bar squared. So this is a picture for the gas characterized by constant density, constant temperature, and some motion of the whole system with constant velocity v, v bar. Okay? So I should logically, I should put first bar and then f. But okay, anyway. So, so this is my local distribution function. What I'm trying to do now is I'm saying that let's now assume that those values of density, temperature, and this velocity, microscopic velocity, actually they are space and time dependent. So I remove my bars here. And I assume that rho is a function of x and t. Temperature is a function of x and t. And velocity is a function of x and t. Okay. And I assume that these quantities uh, change slowly on the, on the microscopic scale. to temperature, to, to T. This, 2 pi times T. This factor is just so that if you integrate over, over velocities, it will give you 1. And that, this integrated over velocity is supposed to be density, so that it, will, it will become equal rho. So that's just for normalization purposes. So now I assume that these guys change slowly. And then we derive effective equations on how they change using Boltzmann equation, and et cetera, et cetera. So we obtain hydro equation. In this case, I will refer to those equations as hydrodynamics proper. So this is actually hydrodynamics, yes. Yes. Molecular scale. Microscopic scale, 10 to the minus 10 for air. This is like really quick collisions of, of, of particles. So at these scales, these, these guys should not change at all. They should change very slowly. Yeah, chapman is one of the procedures of deriving, uh, deriving this equation. Yes, that's right. Yeah. There is this, I mean, I, I do not do that, right, because I did not actually write the equation. So you have to write Boltzmann equation for this for this distribution function first, and then you will have a small microscopic scale there. You assume that, that your solution looks like this, and then you find 
corrections and, and do modifications, and you will find out that row T and V should evolve and, and so on and so forth. That's Chapman procedure starting from Boltzmann equation. Right. But what I'm trying to say is that this is one of the of the origins which I want to consider about the appearance of equations of this type, which which are called uh, equations of hydrodynamic type in mathematics. If you I'm talking about generally full hydro. Uh, if you stop at the first order ingredients, in ingredients you will you will get zero order hydra. But using this Chapman Anskog procedure from Boltzmann equation, you can derive viscosities and high order gradient corrections as well. It's a regular procedure of expanding in derivatives, so you really and, and, and those microscopic scales. I mean the the subtlety appears uh, why, why, is it, why can we derive everything? Because we have a gas, by assumptions. A gas with rare collisions between particles. Using this uh, rare collisions assumptions, then you can, use, uh, you can make these gradient expressions. Generally, if you have strongly interacting particles, we still believe that hydrodynamics will be applicable, because this is, after all, conservation laws with some relationship. But now deriving those exact equations of states and all these uh, constitutive relations might be a big problem. Okay, so this is just one origin of equations of that type which appear. Now, the second one is uh, you really need some slow dynamics of something, right? So you really want something uh, to, to evolving slower than you would expect. Uh, in field theory language, it means appearance of a massless mode, of massless particles. So the spontaneous symmetry breaking is, is next origin. Continuous symmetry. I will just give example. So, if you have sponta continuous spontaneous symmetry breaking, then by Godstone theorem, you have massless mode. Of course, if you introduce now temperature and all that, then uh, saying massless mode doesn't make too much sense, but it still will be slowly evolving mode, and you can add this to your hydrodynamic equations. One particular example which I want to give is if you have superfluid, then superfluid appears as a spontaneous breaking of U1 symmetry, of phase symmetry, spontaneous breaking of phase symmetry. And the other parameter is basically phase theta. And if you introduce quantity gradient theta equals v, which is the velocity of superfluid, then for this v you will have equations of the same type as I wrote, which are hydro equations. So very often people do not distinguish and say that this is superfluid dynamics, but I, I want to stress that that this is a little bit different mechanism. This is not due to the locally conserved quantities, which are conserved because of space-time symmetries, as I said before, but this is more like, like, like internal symmetries. Oh, anyway, so distinction is not sure that very sharp, but this is some other mechanism. So in, in principle, if you have some system with complicated symmetry breaking pattern, then you'll have to include a lot of new slow evolving fields to your hydrodynamics. And the champion among and then some other applications probably is helium 3A, which has complicated symmetry breaking story in them. Hydro is very rich there. And one more origin of those equations is less known, although a lot of people know examples, but I'll try to formulate it as, as some new origin of equations, is the selection of states. I will give you in the next part, actually, I will part it today, but continue next time. Next part, I'm going to talk about hydrodynamics of free fermions. And this is precisely the example of this. When you really do not have hydrodynamics, you do not have closed system of those equations. You have infinite chain of equations of hydrodynamic type. It's not finite number of equations. But then you truncate the system by some, by some conjecture. And that conjecture, in the particular case which I want to consider, is a selection of initial state. So I select initial state 
such that the energy flux can be expressed in terms of the energy density and momentum. And, and if this statement that, in, uh, if this type of state, uh, at least for some time, uh, is, is, is continues to be the same type of state, which energy flux can be expressed in terms of the other quantities, then I can close my system and write hydro equations of hydrotype. Okay. So again, only A should be considered as a proper hydrodynamics. The rest are some generalizations. And this one with selection of it has to do with something which nowadays is called generalized hydrodynamics. So it's essentially uh, built on, on top of, of, of this story. But we will probably discuss it a little bit later. Okay. Any questions? Okay. So I still have about 10 minutes, I think. Hmm? Yes. Yes, right. Well, in English, the word fluid means liquid or gas. So saying that this is gas and you arrive to fluid-like equations, well, of course, it's fluid. <laughs> but, so the question is, is when hydrodynamic approximations breaks down, essentially, right? And uh, it's more or less clear from, from this discussion that the key point here, oh, first of all, this example is a particular example of a gas with rare collisions, and I choose this because here we actually can derive all this rigorously from microscopic expanding in small gradients. But generally, uh, you, you do it phenomenologically for, for strongly interacting fluid, and you hope that, that you have some regimes where your expansion and gradients works. And and then you come up with some equations, and suppose that I start some initial condition with some initial conditions. First of all, I cannot start with initial conditions for which the quantities rho t and v change quickly on the scale of the order of mean free pulse. This does not make sense, because I assume that I averaged over these fast degrees of freedom already, and this is already effective theory. So I cannot really start from initial conditions. But very often, when I take some initial conditions, then in the process of evolution, some huge gradients appear, like shock waves and various kinds. And then I have to check whether, whether in these uh, shock regimes, whether gradients are huge or small compared to the mean free pass. And if they are big, then, then hydrodynamic approximation breaks, and you have to go back to, to kinetic theory description. So that's, that's a good question. Other questions? Yes. You, you have to, yeah, there will be corrections, yeah. So what you do is the following. You are saying that this is zero's order approximation, plus some correction. You substitute it into this Boltzmann equation, and, and, then, uh, and then you first you see that rho t and, and v should evolve in space and time to, to, to make it valid. And secondly, there will be additional correction here, but this correction can be expressed in terms of the of the, of the zeros order uh, recursively. So you basically do uh, order by order expansion in, in, the, in, the, in the value of these microscopic, uh, microscopic parameters. This procedure is, is very well known. It's called Chapman-Anskog procedure for this gas. You can find it in landau lifshitz in volume 10, for example, as, as one example. But yeah. So if you think of something consisting of molecules, then you can always compress, right? So you really, uh, but the question of compressibility is more or less, like for example, for, for fluid, uh, for, sorry, for weather models, very often they consider atmosphere as two-dimensional and incompressible. And, and uh, more generally, it turns out that the, uh, the, assumption of incompressibility works well when the velocity of your fluid is much smaller than the sound velocity. For example, the sound velocity in air is 340 meters per second, and if your typical flow that you want to, uh, to, to, to describe has velocity which is much smaller than that, which is almost all everyday applications, 
then you basically can assume that air is incompressible. Also, we know that it is compressible, but it turns out that this is a, there is a small parameter v divided by sound velocity, which allows you to do that. So this is incompressibility is always like effective thing. You might <laughs> try to come up with some model coming from some microscopic particles which are already incompressible and you cannot change distance between them. I don't know such such a model, I think, but it would be maybe interesting. Like hard spheres rolling over each other, something like that. But for me, it's hard to imagine that if you make these hard constraints, then these things will get stuck. Not do it like. Anyway, so so for now, incompressibility is is the effective one, it's appearing because our scales are smaller. Okay, so let me just start uh, explaining what what I'm planning to do next. I don't have much time to tell too much. So the next, I'm going to talk about one-dimensional hydrodynamics, which of course is much simpler than high-dimensional hydra. One particular simplification, which is huge, is that there are no vortices in, 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 in one-dimensional problem. So fluid moves only along one dimension, so there is not possible to form vortices. And vortices is, is what gives you complication. Say it again, one. Where sleep centers can form. Yes, they don't know. There are a lot of interesting things in, in, in one-dimensional hydra, but there are no vortices in space. It's space vorticity it just does not don't exist. There are, there are instantons corresponding to, to, to pair slips, yes. But yeah, that's a little bit different story. But so in one dimension, hydrodynamics looks like this. In the simplest case, dt rho plus dx of rho v equals zero. And, and so this is the equation for continuity equation. Uh, this, sorry, this is the continuity equation for, for density. And then for Galilean invariant theory, you also have dt velocity plus dx of something like v squared over 2 plus epsilon of rho equals 0. And this is what becomes of Euler equation. And I will assume that thermal effects are not important, so no, no entropy. Right, so it's isentropic too. So these are equations, one-dimensional equations. There are no vorticity in the sense that in high dimensions I can form a quantity curl of velocity, which is a remarkable quantity in high dimensions. And, and this quantity is important in all very complicated problems which exist in high dynamics, like, like turbulence and so on and so forth. In one dimension, there is no such problem because velocity has only one component. But yes, indeed, if you consider time dynamics, then the singularity can form in principle as a result of space-time evolution. So these are equations that I want. And what I want to do next is uh, I want to consider a few topics in one-dimensional hydrodynamics. My first topic will be hydro of free 1D fermions. Then I will consider, uh, if I probably I, I will have time for that, they will consider some instantons in, in this one dimensional high dynamics and they try to address the problems of formation of large deviations uh, in, in densities and velocities of hydrodynamics. These problems are known as emptiness formation probability and Arctic circle problems. I'll talk about this next time. And then number three, if I have time, I will talk about Calogera hydra, hydrodynamics of Calogera particles. But I will gladly skip it because I think Alexios will say some words about that. Oh. Okay. So I will, at least I will not go far into it anyway, so I will do some introduction of this from some particular point of view. So hydrodynamics of particles with long-range interactions in one dimension. So I will talk about this culture dynamics, and then I will go to variational principle in, in general uh, dimensions you know, in the general hydrodynamics. So I think I will stop here. Yes. 
Yes. That's right, exactly. That's why I don't really, really explain. The, the next story about free fermions will be precisely about, about, about this in particular. So it will clarify probably what I mean. Say, say it again. Difference? Reference? Oh, sure, sure. Yeah, of course. I will, I will, I will give all references. Yeah, if you want them now, then you can come, I'll give it, but I'll, I'll write references tomorrow. Yeah. Okay, I think if there, I stop for questions. That's a really good question. So what is the difference between fluid and solid? And there are a few uh, cryptic answers to that. One is that nothing only time scale. People introduce Deborah scale. Uh, there is a, in, in the Bible, it's in, in, the, in the book of Deborah, it's written then, and in his eyes, mountains flow, and so on. So the idea is that if you apply stress for very, very long time, that everything flows. But so, so therefore, there is only difference in, in time. But more precisely, the difference is the following, that fluids cannot contain the shear stress. So what happens is the following, is that assume that you have a solid, like a regular solid, and suppose that you make a displacement of this type, which is called shear displacement. So you basically apply force and, and you make the deformation of the solid in, in the shear way. Then we know that well, you can look in the microscope and see that this is different from this one. And this is supposedly equilibrium state. So there should be some restoring force. So there should be some stress which tries to return this to the, to the initial, initial uh, uh, configuration. And um, that's about solids. Now let's assume that you have gas of fluids. So you have something like this. And then you displace it in this way, and you get something like this. And you really cannot tell the difference. So the energy of this and energy of this is the same. And I'm talking about static configurations, not time dependent. Therefore, there will be no restoring force returning fluid to the original state. And this is what we usually call the definition of the fluid. So you basically do not include stresses. In the, on, only dynamically, when you have velocities, you can have friction forces and, and stuff like that but not uh, statically. Well, I saw that I understood that for like 20 years or so or more. And then uh, I learned uh, actually quite recently that, that if you take Laughlin state for fractional quantum Hall effect, that apparently it has, it has uh, this, this, even if you put it on a torus, which is skewed, there will be some restoring force. And that still blows my mind. I don't know now what fluid is. But, in, but that's in magnetic field, so you, there might be some ways around it. But generally, the definition is the following. If you do not have this shear modulus, elastic shear modulus, then you call it fluid. Again, about this de Borda scale, which I mentioned, now let's assume that you don't have regular crystal, but you have amorphous solid. Then the difference between this and this, uh, between this and amorphous solid is, is, is not so sharp. There's no spontaneous symmetry breaking of translational invariance. It's not sure, so sharp, so you expect that the difference only in the practical, it's in the scale. If you have amorphous solid, like a glass, then if you apply a shear, for, a shear force, then you will have resistance at small time scales, but if you wait for a thousand years, it will flow, which it does. Glasses do flow all the time. 